Aloha everyone, my name is Megan Edgar and I'm with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, our MNMRC. MNMRC is a nonprofit that was founded 11 years ago by Ed Lindsay, an important community leader and cultural practitioner, and Robin Newbold, an accomplished marine biologist. They were concerned about the changes they were seeing in the ocean and wanted to try to problem solve through a bottom-up community-driven approach. Today we have quite a few projects happening around Maui, most of which involve water quality monitoring and watershed restoration. Our primary goals are to make sure Maui has clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fishes. A lot of what we're talking about today is protecting people from the ocean, but I'm going to spend my time talking about how to protect the ocean from people. The hard truth is we're already losing our natural resources at an unprecedented rate and the tourism economic engine won't exist for much longer if that trend continues. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about corals. Corals are pretty unique because they exist due to a mutually beneficial relationship between an animal and an algae. The animal part of the coral is the coral polyp. Coral polyps are in the Nadarian family. Nadarians are animals with very simple body plans that have an ability to sting their prey. Starfish, jellyfish, and sea anemones are also nadarians. Corals are special because they allow a particular type of single-celled algae called zooxanthellae to live inside their tissues. Zooxanthellae are photosynthetic. They make energy from sunlight like plants. And they are important to coral polyps because they provide the polyps with a steady supply of oxygen and a small amount of food in the form of glucose or sugar. Coral polyps are important to zooxanthellae because corals make a protective calcium carbonate shell and provide the algae with a safe place to settle and grow, so there's less chance of predation. It's the zooxanthellae that give corals their color. In order to be healthy, corals need clear water so the energy from the sun can make it through the water column to the zooxanthellae. Water needs to be clean and salty, and the water also has to be pretty warm. Corals can only live within a small range of temperatures. Most corals in Hawaii need the water to be between 73 and 84 degrees Fahrenheit. If any of these parameters change, the water is murky or the temperature gets too high, corals become stressed and may die. Coral reefs surround all of the Hawaiian islands and are extremely important for the well-being of humans and the natural environment. Coral reefs are one of the best defenses we have against shoreline erosion caused by waves and storms. Corals provide a barrier that absorbs a lot of wave energy before it impacts our shores. This protects our roadways, homes, and anything else we have built along the shore. Coral reefs also attract visitors. As you are all very well aware, most, if not all of the people who come to visit Maui, come because they want to enjoy our beaches and see our reefs. Healthy coral reef ecosystems make a huge monetary contribution to Hawaii's economy. Coral reefs are known in biology as the rainforest of the sea. They are extremely diverse and provide homes for many different types of organisms. Although coral reefs make up less than 1% of the entire ocean ecosystem, they support over 25% of the life found in the ocean. If we lose our coral reef ecosystems, it's highly likely that the entire ocean ecosystem will collapse. Because reefs are so full of life, they're also an excellent source of food for people. Most of the fish in our restaurants depend on the reef in some way, either because they live directly on the reef or they're eating the things that live on the reef. Unfortunately, Maui's reefs are not doing well. We have permanently lost 25% of our reefs. They're dead and they cannot come back. Of the remaining living reef, 50% is not doing well, and every year we lose a little bit more. We also have the second lowest amount of reef fish in the state. Oahu gets the sad first prize, but we're not far behind. So why is this happening? One thing we know is that Maui has very poor water quality. Every site tested around the island fails for at least one measure of water quality. Water quality is measured in several different ways. One thing we look at is ocean chemistry. There are acceptable ranges for things like pH, how basic or acidic the water is, salinity, how salty the water is, dissolved oxygen, how much oxygen the water is holding, and the temperature of the water. Each of these things has to fall within a certain range for the ecosystem to be healthy. We also look at turbidity, which is just another way of talking about the clarity of the water. The more turbid the water is, the harder it is to see through it. We look at things like bacteria levels. There are two types of bacteria that are usually tested for. Enterococcus bacteria are found in the intestines of animals like cows and pigs and are an indicator of agricultural runoff. 
Their numbers also correlate well with other types of bacteria, with viruses, and with protozoa. So you can make a general assumption that high enterococcus levels mean other bacterial levels are high as well. Colostridium bacteria live in the human digestive tract and are a good indicator that sewage is present in the water. If cesspools are leaking into the ocean, a common problem on Maui, or something is going on with a wastewater treatment facility, tracking the presence of clostridium can help you determine where the sewage is coming from. We also look at nutrient levels. Nutrients are generally nitrogen and phosphorus, and both come from fertilizers. They're important to monitor because nutrients in the water can cause algae blooms and also feed bacteria, which can make the water unsafe. The Department of Health Clean Water Branch is responsible for monitoring water quality and issuing health warnings. For example, on April 10th, 2019, the Department of Health issued a warning for Kamaole Beach Park 1 in Kihei because the enterococcus levels were too high. Unfortunately, the Department of Health is severely understaffed and very underfunded. They have one person on staff who's tasked with testing all of the fresh water and ocean water around the island. And she's a great at what she does, but it's impossible to do her job. When we learned how understaffed the Department of Health was, we decided to ask what we could do to help. And the end result was that MNMRC partnered with the Nature Conservancy and West Maui Ridge to Reef Initiative to create Hui Okavaiola, a community-based water quality monitoring program. Volunteers go out every three weeks and test 39 south sites in South and West Maui. And we worked closely with the Department of Health so that we created an approved methodology. And that way the Department of Health can use our data to issue health warnings or conduct research. So here's what we know so far. These graphs show you data for nutrients and turbidity at all of our South Maui sites. The dotted red line represents the maximum level recommended by the Department of Health. As you can see, almost every site exceeds the maximum levels for each parameter. The same is true for West Maui. The water quality is actually a bit better in West Maui, but we still exceed the recommended levels at almost every site. This information is important to know because water quality has a huge impact on our health, our economy, our fisheries, everything that's related to the ocean. And of course, poor water quality is going to negatively impact the visitor experience as well. It's really important to keep people out of the water on any day it's brown. Brown water puts people at risk for bacterial, viral, and protozoan infection. It's also harder for everything to see when the water is brown, which means you could end up bumping into a turtle or a seal or a shark, and all of these organisms will react to you if you scare them. To give you an idea of how turbidity impacts the visitor experience, this slide has two photos. In both photos, the snorkeler is about six feet away from the camera. Both of these photos were taken on days where the turbidity levels were above recommended level, because ocean water around Maui is always above the recommended level. But on the bottom right photo, conditions were a little bit worse. Beyond water quality, there are other things threatening our reefs. Many places around the island have more users than they can handle. Oftentimes, these people are inexperienced and lack knowledge of reef ecosystems and end up damaging the reef by stepping on it or kicking it. Chemical pollutants, such as those found in sunscreens, can be a big problem, too. For those of you that work in the resorts or on large snorkeling boats, I know you've seen the slick of sunscreen on the surface of the water when it's crowded. Hawaii does not require fishing licenses or any sort of education on fishing, so many visitors don't know proper fishing techniques or practices and end up damaging the reef or killing threatened or endangered species. We also have a problem with the aquarium trade. People harvest fish for their beauty, but that can seriously disrupt life cycles, especially for species of fish in which one sex is more colorful than the other. Even sadder, 85% of the 24 million fish taken out of the ocean for aquariums die before they even make it to a pet store. Climate change is also a huge threat. The water around Hawaii has been too warm for too long every summer since 2014. Every time this happens, we lose a few more corals to heat stress. Despite all these serious challenges, there is hope. And the reason there's hope is because all of these problems are caused by us, by people. And since we're the source of the problem, we can also be the solution. And that is very hopeful. So what can we do? You are all in the perfect position to make a big difference. You have people coming to you every day who are excited to see Maui and who do not necessarily know they're having an Im a major impact on the reef. This can help, you can help them make better choices and see how small changes in their individual behavior and consumer choices can actually have a really big impact. One of the easiest things you can do is encourage people to use reef-safe sun protection. 
In 2021, most of the products that contain harmful chemicals will be banned for sale in Hawaii. But they are still for sale right now, and there isn't anything in place to keep people from bringing these products with harmful chemicals over from the mainland. So it's important that you teach people not to buy or use products with oxybenzone, octanoxate, or parabens in them. Encourage them to read labels on their personal care products as well. Many anti-aging and dry skin lotions have sunscreens or parabens in them and are equally harmful. You can help out local business owners by encouraging people to buy locally made organic products such as Kuleana sunscreen. Also, you want to discourage people from buying and using aerosolized personal care products. These products are ineffective unless they're rubbed into the skin, and they can be quite harmful if inhaled. I always cringe every time I see a parent thinking he or she is doing the right thing, enveloping their toddler in a huge cloud of sunscreen. Even better than telling people what they can't do, try encouraging people to wear swim clothing. Sell rash guards with your company logo on them and make some extra money while at the same time keeping sunscreens out of the water. Many people have heard that oxybenzone and octanoxate harm the reefs, but they don't necessarily know why. Both of these chemicals are endocrine system disruptors. The endocrine system is a collection of glands that produce hormones, and these hormones regulate metabolism, sleep, reproduction, growth and development, sexual function, all kinds of things. And depending on the organism, the endocrine system is more or less complex, but it does the same thing for all kinds of life. And research has shown that oxybenzone and octanoxate prevent coral sperm and eggs from forming larvae. Additionally, if larvae do form, the chemicals prevent the larvae from growing into adult corals. So what you end up with is a reef full of adult corals that look healthy and keep trying to reproduce, but none of their offspring are viable. And eventually, with no new corals growing, the reef dies off. If you take people snorkeling or scuba diving, you can help the reef out by teaching proper reef etiquette. Make sure your clients know that corals are breakable and sensitive to human touch. They need to keep their fins up and avoid standing on the reef. They should also know how to avoid they should also know to avoid touching or chasing anything like sea urchins or turtles. If you are a kayak or stand-up paddle guide, make sure you stay in deeper water. I've watched many inexperienced kayakers hit the reef with their paddles or scrape the reef with the bottom of their kayak. And corals are very slow growing, so moments like that can take decades to repair. Beginning stand-up paddlers also need to stay in deeper water. It's not safe for them or for the corals if they fall off onto the reef. If you are on a kayak or a stand-up paddleboard and are lucky enough to be close to marine mammals such as whales, dolphins, or seals, make sure you people keep their distance. For those of you working on boats, there are federal laws in place to protect these animals, and it's important for them and for your business to follow the rules. You want to stay 100 yards away and only approach if there are no other vessels around. Drive slowly and carefully and don't make sudden changes in direction. If you are taking snorkelers out on the reef on a boat, be sure to use moorings if you can. I know there are a lot of illegal moorings out there right now, and they can be quite damaging to the reef because they don't have the floats to keep the mooring and the anchor lines off of the bottom of the reef. Anchor lines can cause a lot of damage to the corals, so it's important that you try to use legal moorings. Also, be sure you're cleaning your boat with biodegradable cleaning products at the end of the day. Avoid harsh chemicals such as bleach that are just going to go straight into the water. If you're taking people fishing, teach them about traditional Hawaiian fishing practices and how to be Pono fishermen. Pono practices include avoiding taking fish during the spawning season. They also include only taking what you can eat, only what you need, and not actually going out for trophy fish. Um, you also want to observe resting periods and local fishing regulations. Use proper gear so you catch the species you want to and don't harm species you are just going to throw back. And be sure to recycle your fishing line and report others who are fishing illegally. You can lead by example by avoiding single-use plastics on your boat or at your facility. Encourage visitors to bring reusable water bottles and provide fresh water. If they forget to bring water, require that they buy a water bottle from you. Put your logo on it and it could be a great souvenir. As I said at the start, you are all in a position to influence the outdoor recreation and natural resource side of the visitor industry. You can lead by example and encourage others to make changes in the way that they do things. Sustainable living is trendy right now, and you can grow your business by marketing your choice to be sustainable to, to your customers. If you don't own your own business but work for a larger, or, larger organization, you can make a difference by talking with management. If you're at a resort, ask property managers to consider changing to environmentally friendly landscaping practices. 
encourage restaurants on property to take threatened species and fish that come from unsustainable fisheries off the menu. Ask them to sell reef safe sun protection and see if they have some sort of plan for educating visitors about their impact. If all of us start having these conversations, the messages will sink in. These are things you can also do at a personal level. Each one of us has an impact on water quality and the cumulative effect of all of us using chemical fertilizers or oxybenzone takes its toll. If you're interested in mitigating impact on the ocean through your personal choices, you can learn more about the environmental issues facing Maui and what people are doing about them on the first Wednesday of every month at 5.30 p.m. We host talks at the Sphere at the Maui Ocean Center, and this can be a great place to meet like-minded people and get new ideas. We're also always looking for volunteers. If you have a flexible schedule, our water quality monitoring team is always looking for help. If you're really busy, but want to host a beach cleanup or other kind of community outreach with your company, we can help you organize that. Also, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is called Reef in Brief, or follow us on social media. Remember, you are investing in your future when you teach visitors how to decrease their impact on the reef. Because if we lose the reef, we lose tourism too. I hope this presentation has been helpful to you. I do think there's hope if we all work together to make good choices for the reef. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.